reading Goosebumps some 25-odd years after their release is a very different experience from reading them when they first came out. Of course, Slappy's death in Night of the Living Dummy 2 was going to be reversed. Not only are there about a dozen other books about Slappy, he's become the main character of the franchise and effectively its mascot. The modern Goosebumps series is called Slappy World. It's no surprise he's back for part 3. But I might not have thought so if it was 1996 and I was invested in Goosebumps for some godforsaken reason. Slappy's death, with his head shattered and some worm thing crawling out that's heavily implied to be the evil dummy's soul, would have seemed like something you couldn't pedal back from. And with my ability to recognize patterns, I would assume that this Living Dummy series would be about passing the baton to a new dummy character each book. In the first one, Mr. Wood dies and Slappy steps up. In the second book, Slappy dies and presumably Dennis would step up. So Night of the Living Dummy 3 would be about Dennis and what kind of mischief he gets up to. Which would have been welcome, because Slappy in part 2 was barely a fart in the wind. A complete non-threat without any personality. And what's odd is, even though this turns out not to be the case, Dennis isn't a character in this third book and Slappy comes back instead, there's very little hint of Slappy's presence in part 3 in the material surrounding the book. There's no reference to him on the back cover blurb. There's a dummy in a suit that could be Slappy, but ventriloquist dummy in suit isn't an uncommon image. Heck, a bunch of the dummies on this cover are wearing suits. It could be Slappy, it kind of looks like Slappy, but you can't confirm that it is Slappy. And again, to the book itself, it seems they wanted to obscure Slappy's identity, at least somewhat. When our new characters get a hold of him, they don't know his name, so they dub him Smiley. But after he comes to life, he reveals himself as Slappy, and I think at some point this was supposed to be like this major twist. However, everything else in the book gives it away, so I don't know if that was the initial plan and it was dropped, or if Stein was just a weird and bad writer. In any case, since I'm only doing these initial 62 books, this is Slappy's last chance to impress and justify his existence as series mascot. So let's get into it. Today's child protagonist is Trina. Matriloquist dummies have been a part of her life and her little brother Dan's life forever. Their father is a failed professional ventriloquist who now owns a camera store, but keeps the passion alive by buying and restoring old dummies and keeping them in the attic. There are a proper dozen dummies in the attic right now, and that did get me excited. Oh, an entire gang of living dummies? Now there's a twist on the formula. But heaven help me, I am not keeping track of these guys. The only one I have to bring up is Rocky, who Trina thinks looks a little mean. Well, today Dad brings in a new dummy to make it an unlucky 13. I found this one in a trash can, he told us. Do you believe someone just threw it away? The head was split in two, but it took two seconds to repair it. Just a little glue. I leaned close in to check out Dad's new treasure. It had wavy brown hair painted on top of his head. The face was kind of strange, kind of intense. I've got this mental image of Dad running around the neighborhood at night, going to everyone's trash cans, giggling a bit, lifting the lids and going, Hello, any ventriloquist dummies in here? Seriously, it's one thing to say you found it in a dumpster. I'm pro dumpster diving. But someone's personal trash can is a bit too far. Hey look, I found a broken ventriloquist dummy. And a used pregnancy test. And all these bank statements full of delicate information. Again, the characters call this new dummy Smiley, but we know it's Slappy with Dad describing the exact damage received in the last living dummy book. Trina messes around with Slappy for a bit and finds the little card with the bring dummies to life magic words. Karu, Mari, Odana, Loma, Malianu, Karano, and Slappy immediately slaps her in the face. She thinks Dan did it, but there's no time to pursue that. And I need to point out, this is all still super early in the book. Dad brings out the fixed up Slappy on page 10, and Trina says the magic words and gets slapped on page 13. And I'm like, yes, get this stuff out of the way quick. We all know about Slappy. We all know he's alive. Get the formalities over as soon as possible and get to the hijinks. Alas, the book does not maintain this pace. 
It's spring break, there's no school, and Trina's uncle Cal and cousin Zane are staying over for a few days. Zane, despite being a big kid, is a gentle soul who is easily frightened by his own shadow, and thinks Trina and Dan's big house is creepy. I mean, there's an attic full of ventriloquist dummies, he's not wrong. Last year, the siblings teamed up to scare Zane during his entire visit, nearly giving the poor kid a heart attack, but they promised to behave this year under the threat of summer camp being taken away from them. But things start going wrong immediately. When Zane goes to the guest room to unpack, Rocky the dummy falls on top of him, startling him. And it keeps going, Rocky appearing in weird places. Zane's room, the dining room in the middle of the night when Zane goes down to get a midnight snack, just following the kid around. We know Trina isn't doing it because she's our point of view character, and it seems unlikely that Dan is doing it. Could Rocky actually be alive? Zane is also into photography and has been going around the place taking random photos. In an effort to play nice, Trina and Dan help Zane develop his photos, only discover that something has gone horribly wrong. Hey, who shot this? Zane demanded angrily. Dan and I moved closer to see the photo. Who shot this? He repeated. He furiously picked up another sheet from the developing pan. Another one. Another one. How did this get on the roll? He cried. He shoved them all toward Dan and me. Photos of Rocky. Close-up portraits. Photo after photo of the sneering dummy. Oh no. How horrible. Selfies in a time before Instagram filters? It's a nightmare. But Dan gets to thinking, I didn't do it. And my sister didn't do it. Maybe Zane is doing it? It's a sound theory. More sound than the dummy has come to life. So Trina and Dan sneak up to the attic and hide. And indeed, they catch Zane coming up to grab Rocky to pose him for another fake prank. Yes, Zane has been doing all of this to get Trina and Dan in trouble. And you know what? Good for him. It sounds like Trina and Dan were complete monsters last year. I I'm rooting for you, Zane. But now that he's found out, Zane and the siblings agree to a truce. Everything's even, no more pranks. Let's just have a good time. By the way, we're halfway through the book at this point, and Slappy hasn't done anything. And we already did the it was actually one of the kids who did it twist in the first Living Dummy book, with much more interesting results than a dummy took some pictures. Well, now that Zane's found out, it's time for Slappy to take over, and his pranks are a lot more destructive. Zane's room gets trashed, his camera gets destroyed, the family dinner gets wrecked. There's a lot of tension going around. Dad is furious but doesn't know who to blame. Each of the kids thinks one of the others has broken the truce. Trina and Dan stake out the attic at night to try and catch Zane in the act again, but this time, who shows up but Slappy, carrying a very not alive Rocky around. Why is he doing this? What could Slappy possibly want? What do you want? I cried. Why are you doing this to us? Why are you getting us in all this trouble? The ugly grin spread over his face. If you treat me nice, slaves, maybe I won't get you in any more trouble. Maybe you'll be lucky. He tapped his head and added, Knock on wood. Ah, yes, the, the slaves thing again. Literally nothing has changed since Living Dummy 2. Slappy has no motivation beyond slaves. I get it's a power trip, but it's a boring power trip. And the exact same power trip from the last book. You know, you could have used Slappy's head getting busted as an excuse to alter his personality, make him more unhinged or something, but Arl Stein will never fail to pass up an opportunity. Oh, and speaking of things that also happen in Living Dummy 2, Slappy is super easy to manhandle. I dove fast and wrapped my hands around his skinny legs. He let out a harsh, angry cry as I began twisting his legs around each other, struggling to tie them into a knot. Dan, grab his arms! Hurry! My brother moved quickly. Slappy tried to bat him away, but Dan ducked low, and when he came up, he grabbed Slappy's wrists and held on. Again, it kind of deflates the horror of it all when the titular threat is so easily wrangled by a couple of children. There's a well on the property, so Trina and Dan go outside and dump Slappy into it. But since Slappy's made of wood, and wood usually floats, it's not that hard for him to climb out. So Trina's next move is to try and say the magic words again. Maybe saying them a second time will reverse the spell. 
So she wrestles the card from Slappy up in the attic and says them again, and Slappy is fine. But suddenly, the dozen other dummies in the attic spring to life. I, uh, I don't know why they didn't come to life the first time Trina read the words. That was also up in the attic. The dummies were all there, but, but whatever. These dummies are good guys, and now Slappy is greatly outnumbered. I couldn't see what they were doing to Slappy, but I saw their skinny arms jerking and tugging. I saw them all struggling together, wrestling with him. Were they pulling him apart? I couldn't see, but I heard Slappy's scream of terror. Yeah, that sounds gruesome, but once the twelve dummies stop, Slappy is still in one piece. He's not moving, he seems stopped, but it's like the other dummies tickled him to death or something? The other dummies stopped moving for some reason, I don't know, but they're not alive anymore, and it seems the terror is over. Zane's visit comes to an end, and as a going away present, Dad lets Zane take one of the dummies home. Zane, who never knew he was alive, chooses Slappy, and as Zane carries Slappy out, Slappy gives Trina a wink. He's not actually dead, dun dun dun. Okay, so that's it. That's the end of the Night of the Living Dummy trilogy. And for one of the most foundational titles in the Goosebumps canon, it has no business being a trilogy. R.L. Stein had one idea, an idea that might have been good enough for one book, and then he repeated himself twice. Part 3 does have some moderate improvements, though it's mostly in what the book doesn't repeat from the other two. None of the kids are into ventriloquism, they don't try to put on acts that the living dummy sabotages. There's no living dummy baton pass ending to make us think Slappy's story is over, so that's all good. And it's not the worst executed Goosebumps book in the world. I appreciated the mid-book twist with Zane doing all the spooky pranks. Zane's easy to like, which is a rarity for Stein's young characters. But there's not enough new material here to justify its existence. If this was a third draft of Night of the Living Dummy, I'd say it was a step in the right direction. But as a third part of an ongoing story, it is so tedious and repetitive. Also, the ending just sucks. I don't get how the dummies stopped Slappy, I don't get why they didn't come to life before, and I don't get why they stopped being alive after. And it just makes you wish the book was about a mob of living dummies, like a ventriloquism-themed gremlins. When it comes to my traditional rewrite, well, I think the whole trilogy needs to be reworked from the ground up. But if we're just reworking this book on its own and not touching the first two, now would be the time to explore the living dummy mythology. You know, give Slappy a backstory, figure out where the magic words came from. If you're not actually doing the living dummy baton pass thing anymore, if you're committed to making Slappy the reoccurring villain of the series, then it's time to give him a history and motivation. Scanning the Goosebumps wiki, I'm aware that Slappy's been given backstory in the post-classic Goosebumps books, which is a good thing, I guess. I can't speak to the quality of that backstory, but too little too late, I think. Give his backstory here. Give us 13 Libby dummies. Get into the stuff early and ramp up the chaos. Escalate, escalate, do something different. Do something different. I just, I didn't read Goosebumps as a kid. I was aware of it. I absorbed it through cultural osmosis and it left the impression that Slappy the Living Dummy was this funny, dastardly, reoccurring villain. But that was all marketing. Slappy sucks. He's a wimp, he's boring, and he's uncreative. The Living Dummy books aren't the biggest trash fires in the Goosebumps series, but they're easily the most disappointing. I give Night of the Living Dummy 3 nothing. 